I don't know about you, but I love the change in weather, even though it's going to get warm again because it's Indiana. But um, when it's cold outside, that's my favorite time of year. When it's cold and rainy, boy, you're right. When it's cold and snowy, it's even better. I love it. Well, anyway, January 6th, let's go back in the Wayback Machine, January 6th, 1850, was a bitterly cold morning in Colchester, England. It was a hard, biting blizzard, keeping most worshipers at home. At the primitive Methodist chapel on Artillery Street, only about a dozen people showed up that day. When it became apparent that even the pastor would not arrive, a man spoke from Isaiah 45, 22, and he said this, Let all the world look to me for salvation, for I am God, there is no other. Then the crowd dispersed, thinking the day's service a loss, not realizing that a 15-year-old boy had ducked into the room to escape the snowstorm and hearing the sermon had believed in God for the first time. Years later, that boy wrote this, don't hold back because you cannot preach in St. Paul's Cathedral. Be content to talk to one or two in a cottage. His name, Charles Spurgeon, who would go on to be at 22 years of age, one of the best known preachers in the whole entire world. I wonder this morning, If we start thinking about what we have to give, what can we do if we sometimes think way too small when it comes to serving others and helping others? We're wrapping up this series today, but I want you to think about what you have to give. Because the message today is don't hold back. If those 12 or 15 people that were there that day had just said, it's only us, nobody else, this isn't really that big of a deal, let's just go home and we can watch Joel Osteen. Or, not that. You, what? It's not in my notes. I shouldn't have said that. Gosh. Anyway, I'm just going to move on. Use what you have. Let's start there. <laughs> Don't hold back. There's an old song that we used to sing growing up that said, Little is much when God is in it. I wonder this morning, though, if you think you have too little. You think, I can't do anything, I can't do that, I can't help here, I can't serve in this spot, I can't give that much, I can't give any, I can't do anything. I wonder if that's us, but think about this, you can cook in small pots as well as big pots. Think about this, little pigeons can carry great messages. And we have a a miniature schnauzer, and I I know this one's true, Uh, even a little dog can bark at a thief. What in, the, what in the world does all of this have to do with me and my relationships? I firmly believe this morning, and so does our enemy who tries to attack us with anything and everything, that you and your story and what God has gifted you with today can be used by God. I'm going to say that again. I firmly believe that what God has given you in your situation, you're like, well, I don't have this giant big testimony where I did all of these things. And I'm talking about what God has gifted you with and what he has given you. God can use it. The question is, will you let him? You're like, well, I, only have, I can only do this. If we get in the way and we worry about what we have being too insignificant, If we get in the way and worry about the what God has given us and miss the who he wants us to share it with, we will miss the point every single time. As we finish today talking about our relationships and how they need to be built to last, I want to leave you with a a few final reminders. And we're going to be in Romans chapter 12 this morning. It's going to be on the screen. There's 18 verses, so settle in. Romans 12, it's starting in verse 1, reading through 18, says this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and a holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. You wonder how to worship God? It just told you. Offer your body everything you have. That is, that is your worship. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know what God's will for you, what, what is God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. 
Because of the privilege and authority that God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith that God has given each of us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. Verse 6, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if, you're, and if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. It's kind of hard to show kindness without being glad, but maybe you can do it. I can't. Don't pretend, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tight to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. I wonder this morning, what has God given you? What are you holding this morning that God has gifted you with? Maybe it's an experience. Maybe it's something that he's forgiven you of. Maybe it's something that, that you're good at. I read down that list and you're like, okay, I could probably do that, but I don't know about the other. But maybe you have this one thing that God has given you. Do you have something that someone in your life needs today? Think about that question. Do you have something that someone specifically needs in your life right now? And you're sitting there holding it and they're over here with a need. I bet you do. The question is, is will you use it? Will you give it to someone that needs it or will you hold back? I believe this morning when God transforms us, we realize that it's not about us. Let's run down all that Paul challenges us to do. We are to serve others, to teach others, to encourage others, to give to others in need. We are to show kindness to others. We are to bring peace to others. In the middle, he challenges us to love others from the center of who we are, to not fake it, to choose to do these things from the transformed heart and mind and strength. In the verses we read, we're going to give ourselves to God because of all that he's done for us. I said, that's our worship. You know, I, I'm not good at worshiping. I can't sing. Well, singing's not worship. It's part of it. But you're like, well, I, I can't worship God because I'm not a good... You, should, you don't want to hear me sing. Even my dog doesn't want to hear me sing. So what? That's not just worship. You worship God with everything you do. Everything you do. When you serve, when you teach, when you encourage, when you give, when you show kindness, when you bring peace to a situation, that is your worship to God. That's it. It says, when you do these things, we choose to do them from a transformed heart. All that he's done for us, that is our worship. That's our response. Then in verse 2, we're told, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Can I preach for a minute? I think, I think, I think we can struggle with what we're going to be called to later in this chapter because we are trying to copy worldly behavior but expecting holy results. I think we're trying to do all of, all of it, all of these things by what the world says. Well, will you go to survey, teach all these things that, that you're supposed to do and this is what you should get. All of this is, equals that. But we're not trusting in the Holy Spirit to help us do what we need to do. We're not transforming our minds. We will serve others, but they need to serve me too. I will teach you, but I'm going to teach you in ways that maybe not be done in love. I'm going to teach you the hard way. 
I don't see that in Scripture. Now, there are times when you need to tell people the truth, and sometimes it's a hard truth, but can still be done in love. Jesus did it all the time. We only encourage those who encourage us. They're in my circle. I'm a really good encourager to two people, but there's 10 people that need it, but I'm, they're not in my circle, so I'm not going to encourage them. We're going to give, but only when it doesn't really cost us, when we have extra. We're going to be kind, but only after the other person is kind to me. I'm going to let this other person in front of me after someone lets me in front of them. Uh, okay. We will bring peace to a situation after and only after we've said our peace. Worldly behavior from a worldly viewpoint can't expect holy results. We get frustrated when we look back and we don't see a path of solid relationships that God is using to bring these people into a closer walk with him because I think we're doing it wrong. We're doing it on our own strength. It isn't about us. It's not about you. It's not about me. I know that's tough to hear, but in verse 3, Paul reminds us not to think that we're better than we really are. Now, this morning, don't go all Eeyore on me. Like, oh, you know, Pastor Andy said this morning that I'm terrible. Not to think very highly of myself. I'm just no good for nothing, rotten scoundrel. Stop. <laughs> your, let me just tell you, your self-esteem, if it gets dropped because you heard wrong, because that's not what the Holy Spirit's saying to you this morning, if your self-esteem is there, it's because you've forgotten that it is rooted and established in being a child of God. So don't forget where you have to start when you start thinking about how good God is making you. It's not about us being good. I'm so good. No, what is God making you? He is making you new every single morning. You're a new creation. But we're transformed in our mind. This is just a reminder from Paul not to compare what you're doing, the relationships you have in your life right now. Some of you, let me just tell you this, your kids and, and, and the, the discipleship opportunity that you have in your home is so big right now, but the enemy wants to say, well, you're not doing what are you doing? Who are you reaching? You're, you're sl- you, got, you got a lot going on. But those kids in your home, that's your first, that's your first ministry opportunity. <laughs> and if you aren't ministering well at home, you need to start. Because that's your first spot. Find out how you're going to do that. You bring God into every situation that happens. Spilled milk, outbursts of anger, lying about a grade, stole too many cookies. Situation, situational discipleship is amazing. They stole cookies? Well, let me tell you what happened <laughs> when these people stole from God. And, and, and I mean, you have to watch your, your stories. It might scare them to death. <laughs> but use what that day brings to disciple those closest to you. I think so often we get caught up in this, like, we're, we're waiting for the, the clouds to open up and this discipleship opportunity for us to speak into someone else's life when they're standing right next to us. We've got people in our lives that need your kindness and your love and your peace and your encouragement, and you're like, where are they at? Where are they at? And they're standing right next to you, standing right there. The rest of us, don't compare or wish that, that you did this or you had that or, or, or you wish you were doing a certain thing in the church or you wish that you could do this. Use what you've been given. Love who you've been given. Paul is reminding us that it isn't about us. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about loving God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving others. That's what this is all about. So how are you doing in that area? Where is the fruit of the Spirit in your life today? This isn't a contest to see who can have the most fruit of the Spirit every week. We don't come in here like, well, this week I was super, super joyful, so I'm good there. No. We are sent out to live in community, to to move closer to our Father, and to serve, and to give, and to teach, and to love, and to bring peace and kindness, to give others Uh, to give to others and encourage them to get closer to him. So how's that going? For some, it's a struggle because when it comes to relationships and, and our relationships with others, we can get caught up on outcomes of what we are called to do and we start to limit our efforts. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 and 7 says this, I planted the seed in your heart and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. It's not important. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. 
We talked last week about how God can't forgive us if we fail to forgive others. This week kind of feels the same. I would suggest that we not put filters on our output, what we're giving to others, what we're ser- how we're serving, and not expect God and his input to us to change a little bit. Don't limit what your output is and expect God to keep doing the same input. He wants you to be filled with his spirit so that you can give to others. It's not just about us. We are cautiously optimistic that our efforts for the Lord could go well, but we don't expect them to change other people. They don't, we don't, other people really don't change. Have you heard that said? They don't change their behaviors toward us. We don't love others and forgive others and help others and serve others and show kindness to others and bring peace to the situations because we expect certain outcomes. If we only fulfill what this passage says when the outcomes are certain, we would fail to find the heart of God. If the outcomes aren't met, we may start with holding and holding back because we've already determined the outcome. I'm not going to show this person that's in front of me kindness because I don't think they're going to show me kindness. I'm not going to be loving to my, my spouse. If you're not in the marriage class and, and you've got, you're on the crazy cycle and if you don't know what that is, come talk to Pastor Gary. You, you've not gone through that. You should. But what if Paul never planted that seed and what if Apollos never watered it? God wants to use you to do your part so that he can do his part. Are you going to work in the kingdom with God? Well, then the, then the butts start coming. But, but what if I serve, but no one notices it? Or it's in such a small area, and the devil makes you feel like it maybe doesn't even matter. But what if, if they don't thank me for my encouraging word, and they act weird? You ever get around people that when you encourage them, they, they act super weird? They're like, that was just such a great, and like, thanks? And they ask you a question mark, thanks? <laughs> This isn't Jeopardy. Like when you encourage someone and they come back and you're like, that's not, that's not what it's about. We don't encourage people because they're like, well, you're such a good encouragement. I, and they encourage you back. You're waiting for that. That's not why you encourage. That's not why we do any of these things. Let them be weird, but let them be encouraged. But what if they don't like my teaching? What if they don't like my advice? What if they don't like the wisdom that I'm giving them? So what? It doesn't say in here that, that you're, you're, you're going to have all these great, great experiences. It says what we're supposed to do for others. Because this, I know that Proverbs 18.2 says, A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Mr. T must have had Proverbs 18.6 on the mind when he said, I pity the fool. Because it says this, A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calls for blows. You're called to share wisdom and teach, not to make them understand and apply it. That's on them. That's on the Holy Spirit. And you're not the Holy Spirit. So if you're trying to convict people, stop. If you're trying to do all these things, that's not your job. Your, your job is to love them. And if they need a word from God and wisdom from God and he's speaking it through you, give it to them. And let the Holy Spirit do the rest. Let God do his part. But what if they take advantage of my kindness? What if they take advantage of my gift? I would say what I'm calling us to is radical, but Jesus kind of said the same thing in Luke chapter 6, so you can take it up with him. It says this, verse 32, Luke 6, 32. If you only love those who love you, why should you get any credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great. And you will be truly acting as children of the Most High. For he is kind. Hear me. Hear this. This is what in verse 35. For he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. The outcomes of you obeying God when it comes to loving others and applying this passage shouldn't keep you from actually applying the passage and what was said. We won't get it right every time in every situation, but we must strive to be present with the relationships that you have and don't hold back. Don't hold back. Verse 2 from the passage today says this, 
Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I I watched a, um, a video not too long ago, and the guy was talking about how we view time. And this guy had some parents that were, that were older, and he said, how many times do you see your parents? And he said, twice a year. And so let's just say that they have five more years to live. Yeah, I get, I get to see them for five more years. No, 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 no. You only get to see them ten more times. I think sometimes the enemy tricks us to say, oh, don't worry about it. There's people beside you that have a need. Oh, I'll get, I'll get to it eventually. I got plenty of time. I got all these times. I think we think about it wrong because God wants us to live right here and right now. Man, I mean, (laughs) God's going to give you what you need for today. But so often we we want we want instant gratification. So if I give something or serve somewhere, I want I want the 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 adulation. I want the praise right now. I want the the, I want the credit right now. Because I, I, I crave that. But I'm telling you this morning, if we want to store up treasures in heaven, we have to realize that we have to do these things no matter the outcome. No matter if we get noticed. No matter if we, we love other people and they don't love us back. You only get one chance to live today. Rarely do you get the same opportunity back to be kind to others. You'll never get those moments back. You'll never get those words back. So choose them wisely. You'll never get seasons or, or time back. When it's all said and done and we're facing the end, I wonder, will you be thinking about all the kindness that you gave out or will you be thinking of all the times when, when, when you shouldn't have been kind to people? It's about relationships, right? At the end, I, I, I firmly believe that. Will you be thinking about the times that you helped others by serving them and the relationships that you built and giving to them or encouraging them? Or you, will you stay there as you're getting ready to enter, hopefully into heaven, and think, man, you remember that time I, I helped somebody and they took advantage of me? <sighs> Shoot, I shouldn't have done that. You remember that time I gave somebody something and they, they just they didn't even they didn't even appreciate it? You remember that time I was I was kind to someone and they didn't show it back to me? Remember that time that I showed love, but there was just no love in return? I don't think that's gonna be I don't think that's gonna be the case. I think we're gonna be thinking there, okay, God. I planted the seed. Someone else can water it. You're going to make it grow. That's what relationships are all about. Loving God with everything we have and loving our neighbors. That's what we've been talking about. We talked about our relationship with God and how he needs to be at the center. We talked about how we should love others and forgive them. It's tough things. This morning, God is calling us to relationships that are built to last. I don't want us to find ourselves hoarding all the goodness that God has given us. I don't want us to find ourselves that we're we're holding back from those around us. You never know. You never know what God can do with what you give him. You never know. Ephesians 5, and, and I'll end with this, starting in verse 15, says this. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual song among among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What do you have this morning? What do you have to give? What has God gifted you with that you can give others? That's question number one. Question number two, will you give it away? Are you going to hold on to it? It's up to you. I can't do it for you. God can't do it for you. That's your act of service is when you completely give yourself to God. and Everything that you have, that's worship. Let's pray. Father, this morning... As we think about what we have to give, as we think about those around us, we've talk, been talking for a while about relationships. And Father, I just pray that you would help us to see those around us right now that need what we have. Would you make it apparent? 
Would you help us to see those around us that uh, maybe we don't need, maybe we don't know, but um, we're going to come into contact this week and we're going to have a moment where we can just stop and say, okay, God, I'm going to step into this moment. Would you help me to serve, to give, to encourage, to love, to bring peace to a situation? God, would you open up our, our minds and our hearts as we try to live this passage out? God, help us to not worry about the, 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 what, what happens at the end. And help us just to do our part and not hold back. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing.